Good morning, everyone. We don't have much time. Um, so uh, in order to add to the introductions that Alexandra made, I'd just like Egosa to uh, give us a little bit more color about what you do, um, what's your, your everyday, your normal day like? Great. So thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Uh, very, very glad and very grateful to be here. So my name is Egosa, and I run a technology venture capital fund called EcoVC. We're based in Lagos, Nigeria, and we invest in Africa-focused technology startups, uh, starting from seed stage startups all the way to early growth. Uh, we have a, a traditional sort of regular seed stage fund, and in partnership with TPG Growth and the TPG Rise Fund, uh, we do early growth uh, investments with larger check sizes. And we do a lot of things across multiple sectors, agriculture, healthcare, financial services and inclusion, education, and, and, and of course, media. Great, thank you. And Ludwig? Um, well, I'm actually a bit of an odd bird on this panel because I don't do investment in Africa. I'm much more from the NGO side and maybe a little bit the social impact investment side, but they are the very social end of social impact investment. Um, I've done almost 10 years experience with doing social projects, um, especially in the remote areas of Africa. So I'm not so much targeting the cities where an investor like you would be, but rather the really remote areas. And we are trying to build up sustainable systems there. I think the, the, what got me invited here is a program called Startup Lines, where we take people who really live in the Tukana Desert, where there's very, very poor conditions and most of them had no access to computers or technology or anything. And within one year, we train them as online freelancers so that they can make their own incomes in areas like web development, graphic design, video animation. And we believe that, and we've actually proven that within one year of training, we can get them on a good income generating base. So we're really targeting, so after the first year for them to get something like $500 a month, and after a couple of years, it might rise to a thousand or more, which for that area is an amazing income and um, is suddenly enabling them to, in their home, live a fully globalized digital career. Brilliant. Um, early in the conference, uh, I'm sure many of you saw Fatumata Bar talking about how risks in Africa are overestimated and potential is underestimated. Um, Egosa, what sort of um, myths and misconceptions have you come across uh, whenever you talk to um, potential LPs about investing in Africa? What's the, the thing that you often have to work against in the minds of potential investors? I think the biggest problem for us is Google uh, because once you mention Africa, someone's like, let me Google that. And, uh, and you know, there's always some bad news and they think, well, that's essentially what, what, what is holding back the continent. Uh, so that's one problem. Uh, the, the, the second, I think, is a lack of, of understanding of how these opportunities get framed. Um, because in many, many cases, you know, people don't track what Africa is going to be. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was at a, I was a, as a lunch with, 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 with some of the, the Berta Media folks, and, I, and I, had, I pointed out to the folks that many people don't know that Nigeria will be the third most populated country in the world in, in, in 30 years. Um, that is after India and China. And, and that's one of the, 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 the sort of misnomers about Africa. It represents a very large set of opportunities, uh, but most people just don't know because a lot of what they get is, is, is all the bad news and not enough of the good news. Um, thank you for that. And uh, Ludwig, um, one of the questions that I had for you was, um, for those of you who've never been to northern Kenya, um, it's very remote and very dry and very, very difficult part of the country. And your first time there, when you were there, what was your observation that made you um, start investing in schools and starting uh, learning lions? What did you see that was different, that busted a misconception that many people may have about northern Kenya and specifically Turkana? Well, I started off like most Europeans start off when they first come to Africa and they, they just suddenly we come from a relatively safe environment like Munich which where everything is pretty much guaranteed and then you're suddenly thrown into an, into a world where people live in 
are probably pretty much the same way where they have lived a couple of hundred years ago and under, from a humanitarian economic point of view in horrible conditions. And then your brain starts working and working. And I think everybody at the beginning makes the same mistakes. So we think, oh, we need, um, they need our help so much. And first of all, let's, let's, what can they do immediately? Can they not make baskets or something like that? So I started off like this as well, sort of trying to get them jump-started to repeat the development we had in Europe. But at some point, working there for longer, I realized, and especially talking to the people there, the young people there especially, uh, no different than in Europe. They have exactly the same dreams, they have exactly the same potential, and getting them to do something small like baskets or little agriculture is not the way for them. They want to be part of the world, they want to be part of the digital world, and that's where we got the idea that suddenly we had internet connection. It wasn't there when I started, but then it rapidly came, and now it's in every village. Yeah. Can we not really let them do the same stuff that we do here? Sure. Let them be really a part of it. Yeah. And just to um, take that arc again, um, so Kenya is one of those countries where we've seen rapid digitalization. Um, more than 80% of the country has access to mobile broadband. Um, and also just generally, if we extrapolate to a bit more of the world, uh, we have 5.5 billion adults on earth and 5 billion of them already have mobile phones. So there's already a lot that has been talked about, about the mobile money revolution and largely digitization has happened um, in Kenya. There's some varying levels of digitalization in um, other countries, like South Sudan is still coming online. It's starting to get mobile money and starting to get connected. However, um, what do you see um, as sort of the um, next opportunity beyond mobile um, that, that uh, EcoVC or you, that you see as something that you would like to to really um, uh, invest in and to, to, to bring up? Sure. So the way we, we, we started, we raised our first fund uh, four years ago. It feels like forever. Um, but the way we thought about, about framing our investing activity um, was to sort of carve it into four quadrants. Um, and a lot of this was sort of based on sort of observations. And I think we continue to sort of see how, how these things are evolving very nicely. So the first thing was recognizing that in many African cities, um, you know, friction was a very important part of day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. um, not optimal, but important. And so what we recognized was the ability to build and deploy products and services that we call lubricants um, would have outsized impact on, on people. So that was sort of one, one, one quadrant. The second quadrant was also recognizing that while we talk a lot about digital or tech-enabled products and services, uh, a lot of these economies or micro-economies in Africa are offline. And so what you, one of the things you want to be able to think about is what do we need to do as ecosystem participants to bring you know, consumers and enterprises offline to online. And organizing the offline is a very key part of and sort of the second quadrant of that. And it's one of the things where we think is, you know, local entrepreneurs have an advantage over non-local entrepreneurs because it requires a high resolution understanding of, of the offline. And it's not something where you can sit down and build a service in San Francisco and think you've cracked the code. It doesn't work like that. And so that was key. The third was, was recognizing that the African consumer is incredibly fragile, right? So they, they, they want to do all these things like everybody else, um, but they, they have not been given a lot of these tools, you know, whether it's education or, or health and, and the like, uh, and really technology to, to, to sort of become anti-fragile. And so a lot of that was, you know, focusing on that as an arc, whether it was, you know, women or it's children or it's family or it's culture. Um, and then the fourth was lift, right? And that's sort of where we put the things like education and entertainment as well. And one of the things that's interesting to us in Africa is, you know, everybody says, well, there's five billion mobile phones and, you know, you know, everybody's being touched. And the truth is, when you unpack it, which is, I think, a lot of what Africa is, you then realize that the opportunity really hasn't been captured yet. So, for instance, uh, Nigeria has approximately 172 million mobile subscribers approximately 180 million people, but the mobile penetration is like 
So what you then get is that when you look at the mobile subscriptions, you realize that you need to dedupe or deduplicate that because what you find is a lot of people have two phones <laughs> with multiple SIMs. <laughs> and uh, Nigeria, for instance, is another large country, 180 million people, but only 30% of the country is covered by 3G. Mm. So there's a 70% upside because everything is 2G, 1G, or no G, right? And so, so when you talk about upside and you talk about mobile, you then realize that there's so much to do. And the rural populations, we estimated internally there's about 45 million Nigerians that are not on a mobile network. And partially it's because serving rural populations has never been interesting to telcos because no one has actually been able to change the economics of serving these. And we are investing in companies like that and hopefully we'll start to make some more announcements this year about things like that where you can bring you know, networks to the rural areas, you can bring more people, and then you can now start talking about digital services, financial inclusion, you know, telehealth and the like. Um, one of the things that came up earlier in the conference was this idea of the optimist see the glass as, <laughs> as half full, the um, pessimists see the glass as half full, optimists see... Uh, uh, half empty. Ha pessimists pessimist see it as half empty, empty. optimists see it as half, half. full, and then the realists take the glass. What would you say uh, is the realist's view about um, the challenges and the gaps uh, that need to be faced head on? Because um, we, can't, we don't want to just paint a picture of, oh, investing in Africa is this massively amazing thing that you need to do immediately. There's some um, realistic challenges that need to be faced head on. And uh, I'd like both of your view on what would be the one or two big things that are an issue? Well, I think there's really, about the optimist-pessimist thing in Africa, I think there's really two completely different conceptions out there. On the one hand side, we have the optimism. So we have amazing people like Fatuma, who spoke at the conference, or even you, Juliana, who just show us that, this, that there are people in Africa to look up to, and there are companies being built to become unicorns, and there, there's amazing stuff happening. And then on the other side, we have the pessimist view in Africa. We have plenty of NGOs putting out posters of starving children and trying to get some money to help those. And um, there we paint the picture of Africa, which is sometimes actually not even that inaccurate. There are areas where people are really suffering a lot and where, where they in some sort need help. But there's really the sort of pity conception, sort of the pessimist pity conception of Africa. And then you have to at some point put the realist point of view in the middle and you have to say there is really both is happening. There are amazing people and I'm sure that's the people you invest in yeah. that build amazing companies in the capitals. But then at the same time, there is, is millions and very soon billions of people living in these remote areas because there's, there's actually where we have the demographic problems. Um, I'm from a family of five. Few of my friends in Nairobi have that many siblings or children, but if you go out to the remote areas, there you find mothers with 10 children and more. So this is actually where the huge demographic problem of the future, or let's call it challenge of the future will be. So we, we cannot just sort of, it's good to be optimistic and to look at these amazing success stories, but we cannot just sort of rest in that and say, now we can, it's, it's all is going, going good and this will solve everything, because probably it will not. So that's probably the pessimist point of view. Now, the realist is that it's not too late to change it. You can see all these children being born. Every second child in the next 30 years will be born in Africa. And you can see each one of these children not just as a problem, but you can see them as an opportunity. If we integrate them now in our world, in our global digital world, where we can integrate them because we can all connect them, then we can still sort of turn, turn the boat around and actually have a very, very optimistic version of future Africa. Um, so I, w I wanted to add to that. One of the things that, one of the real opportunities I think in Africa is the ability to, to rethink existing systems and processes and approaches to problem solving. Uh, so for instance, education is the classic example. Um, we come out here, whether it's the Europe or US or elsewhere, and you know, you expect that you're gonna get educated by going to school at eight in the morning, coming back at three. There's a process and there's a system. But if you recognize that 
that a lot of that concentration, at least for, for, for delivering quality education, is in the cities, and you still have a very significant rural population, then the ability to extend your, your consumption of educational tools, you know, from, from, from sub, sub, some suburbs to cities, from cities to rural, will require technology, yeah. right? And so how do you now start to teach, you know, the children of today and tomorrow how to sort of learn and acquire knowledge uh, simply by interacting with, 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 with notebooks and, and pads, iPads and the like. That's interesting to us mm -hmm. because everybody's going to have to sort of learn differently. And I think the final thing is also emphasizing, and we've, we've seen this all the time, uh, we'll talk a little bit about things we've unlearned, how to unlearn coming from Silicon Valley to invest in Africa, is fundamentally that you have to value smarts over traditional educational qualifications. Yeah. And if you're able to do that, you start to see very interesting things happen. Um, just to, to circle back on that question around um, new systems and new ways of working. So, for example, when it comes to the challenge of management expertise, um, how do you see technology helping to bridge that gap? And is it possible to have a way to scale these new ways of doing things so that you can have uh, more collaboration? So, for example, um, for the students that are at Learning Lions, it's very remote, but what sort of collaboration or what, how, how does that happen when they're so out, outside of uh, the major cities? I think what you said is they're completely right and I think Africa has the ability of do things different as well yeah. and it has the ability to leapfrog, I just love that word, but uh, what happened in the mobile sector there where they just completely gone from nothing to 100% and overtook Europe, for example, in fintech and payment services. You can pay everywhere in Africa with your mobile phone. The same thing can happen in education. There's no need for us to replicate the same learning procedures we've been using the Western world for the last centuries. They work fine for us here. But if you study here in the Technical University of Munich, um, Almost three, four months of the year you don't study, you work at BMW, you work at Airbus, which is right next to it, mm -hmm. and they have a place for every student. So that works for us. But in Africa, we need to find different ways. We don't have enough of these companies who can provide yeah. internships, so we cannot just copy-paste our education system. We need to leapfrog, mm -hmm. and it is possible. So what we've been working with, with Startup Lines, is really to build a curriculum that is just adapted to the talents and the needs of the people there, basically teaching them exactly what they need, and we've tailored it for them to be successful. Um, so really, I think we can, we can leapfrog in the educational sector, just yeah. as we did in the mobile. Great. Um, what do you think needs to happen in terms of what needs to change in the um, environment in Africa for it to be more um, hospitable to entrepreneurs? I think one of the things that we discussed was this idea that um, failure is not uh, a badge of honor that it is in Silicon Valley. Uh, if we fail in Africa, we get berated by everyone, including our ma mothers and fathers. And um, uh, what do you see needs to happen um, to, to, to change the environment and to make it uh, better for entrepreneurs and therefore for investors? I think, I, think the, I think the various constituencies have to sort of prioritize the importance of, of, of entrepreneurship. There are lots of people who think that entrepreneurship does not move move economies, I, I, I'm one to disagree. Uh, I think that you know, certainly for s small and medium-sized businesses, they power a lot of these emerging market economies. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenges, I think, are one, I don't think a lot of the governments necessarily value that, and, and, and that, I think, has to be more of a systemic change. Um, and I think to the point about sort of the cultural uh, the sort of dissonance, uh, it's fascinating to always watch how failure gets syndicated in, in these emerging markets. Uh, you know, it's not just on you. You know, it's on you, it's your family, it's your brothers and sisters, you know, and people are looking at you going, you know, look, your neighbor became a lawyer, what's wrong with you? Right, and, and, and I think that hopefully starts to change uh, because every failure really should, 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 should sort of enable people to get on to the next, to the next strength. But I think if I had to pick the one thing where we all have to sort of contribute is to systems, mm -hmm. all right? Because I think once you're able to have deployed systems, um, then you don't have as much drift. 
And right now, there's a concept, what they call anyhowness. It's a very Nigerian concept. Anyhowness, where you just sort of like make stuff up as you go. And that's largely because there are really no systems, you know. And so then you have different outcomes, and no one really knows what set of inputs should generate the right set of outputs and the like. And so I think for us, what we are trying to do is to build systems. And in our portfolio, we, you know, we have a portfolio management team in our fund, um, and part of that is building processes, building systems, and then syndicating that to the CEOs and their teams and recognizing what repeatability of processes and systems, the value of that uh, long term. Good, thank you. And um, what new muscles do you feel that people, uh, that investors need to uh, build up and what do they need to unlearn? Uh, not only have we talked about changing perception and being um, a bit more observant of op opportunities like Ludwig was able to see in Turkana, uh, what just really quickly a few things that you would see that need to unlearn and new muscles. So I think on learning, one of the things, I mean, coming back, you know, from the U.S. and the Valley and the like, um, there, were, there were a few things. Um, one of them was just recognizing the power of observation and, and sort of, you know, and you're looking for data. A lot of investors are looking for data-driven decisions, and I'm thinking there's not that much data, so <laughs> what are you going to do? But what you recognize is that if you keep your eyes and ears open, um, you, you start to see patterns that are interesting in sort of the offline. And again, it comes down to what are you learning from the offline. So that's very important because you're not really sure of doing that you know, elsewhere. Um, you know, the, the other thing I think we also have to unlearn, uh, we had to unlearn and we continue to sort of emphasize, is, is, is fundamentally focusing on, on how these, the day-to-day -day consumers sort of think. Right? We've talked about entertainment and betting and the like, and you see this, these types of interesting behaviors showing up even when people don't have a lot of money. But really thinking about how these consumers think, how they operate, how they react. Um, we're very excited about that. But I think if I had to sort of say what is the key thing for an investor should be is also recognizing the importance of patience. Right? These markets are you're not expecting overnight successes. It takes 10 years to become an overnight success, certainly in Africa. But I think, importantly, um, you, will see the, the, you will see these markets ignite. It might take a little bit longer, but we've seen them in China, we've seen them in India, and we'll definitely see them in Africa. What sort of deal structure changes do you, uh, have you had to make when it comes to investing in Africa? Oh yeah, this is, that's an important point. So in the US, your expectation is that if you make an investment as a, as a venture capital investor, someone's going to come and buy the company. Um, I will tell you that the African entrepreneur has no idea if there's going to be any follow-on financing. Mm -hmm. So the sense of urgency they wake up with every morning to hit profitability is very different from anywhere else you'll see. And so what you then have to think about is from, from an exit perspective as an investor, um, you know, you probably will get your exits out of cash flows and dividends. And so you're not expecting a, 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 some sort of Amazon to show up or Microsoft to show up. It doesn't work that way. And so building out these structures to ensure that if a business can hit profitability and free cash flow very quickly, then you can sort of start to take your liquidity from the risk that you took. That's a very important deal structure. We're still trying to convince American and European investors to understand that. Thank you very much. I would like to invite Isaiah Closin to give you um, a sense of what it means when we are investing in the future of Africa. Isaiah and Maureen, please come up. So um, my first question is for Isaiah. Um, the, the last time I met you, this was three years ago, and you were, gradu you were both graduating from the Le Learning Lions program. Um, how far uh, along have you come, and what are you doing now, and what do you see in your future? Uh, first of all, I'll, I would like to thank uh, Startup Lion and the DLD for giving me this opportunity to come to this place. Uh, I'll first of all talk a little bit about myself, where I come from, and where I am today. Um, I come from a very remote area of Trukana. Uh, my family comes from a village where there's no electricity, totally. So you can imagine staying in a village where there's no electricity. Our life is very difficult. Uh, uh, so that one never gave me, uh, that, uh, that one never made me to underwrite myself and see someone not becoming successful in future. So, uh, um, it's making me feel like I'll, I'll yeah. share with you what, what I have. 
so my education was, has been a very, very tough situation for me to go to school. Uh, my parent could not raise fee for both of me and my sister. So my sister had to drop out of school to let me continue because my mother could not afford to pay the fee for both of us. Uh, I went through my education. I completed, but I never got the chance to go to the university because if paying for the school fees for uh, high school was difficult now, the university was going to be a very big challenge because it's super expensive. Until when I heard about uh, Startup Lion, uh, I joined and, and I was trained for almost one year and I started working for my first client. I've worked for so many clients locally and international. I've created so many websites. Uh, this trip has been so excited to me because I'm able to see the kind of clients I've worked for uh, well, in Kenya. So uh, the little amount of money I've been getting uh, through Startup Lion and their support, I was able to take back my sister back to school and she completed just last year her education. So that's really something that's giving me power. Thank you. And it's really motivating me to be a very successful person. Despite paying her fee, there are, there are, there are two uh, daughters from my other brother. I'm also in charge of paying their school fees. So I'm responsible, like in the whole family, I'm, I'm now like the father because I'm raised by a single mother. So, awesome. so I'm taking all my every responsibility. So I want to thank Startup Lion so much because it hasn't only changed my life, but it has only ch also changed the life of my family and my community in general. So I'm looking forward to be a very good uh, web developer. Next time you'll hear me, I'll be called, I'll be maybe standing someone, somewhere talking about, they're talking about me as an African boy who is a successful person and a good web developer in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm Maureen Apu from Kenya. I just went through the same process with Isaiah. But, and right now I'm a teacher. I teach my younger peers in startup clients. Uh, growing up in Trukana as a young woman uh, can be challenging, and especially as a young mother. I became a young mother at a very young age, and this is not so, this is common where I come from, people, girls get married at a very young age and you have a family, surprisingly, at a very young age. And I, I just had the confidence to give my family the best, my son the best. So I took a leap of faith and I joined Start Appliance when well, I was just staying at home, totally not knowing my, what my future would bring. I joined Start Appliance despite the fact that where I come from, technology is meant for boys. It's like something that only boys can do and girls can do. But I believed I could do better, so I joined Startup Appliance, and for a whole year I studied, I worked very hard, I took care of my son. And later on, I was able to encourage other young women in my community to also join and believe in themselves and actualize their visions. And right now, I can stand here and say that I mean, a part of a group that women believe in themselves and have taken a leap of hope to join the technology world and start up their own businesses through the education that we got in startup. In Africa, there's a saying that says, if you educate a girl, you educate a whole community. And that is true to me today as I stand here. I've never been outside Africa. This is my first time in Munich. I've never seen snow. I love snow. I think I love snow. And, but I wouldn't exchange my, my home from here because I want to be a change maker in my own home. I'm pr I like people are proud of me right now because of what education has made me. I'm able to take care of my son. I'm able to encourage other young women to do what I can do. I'm a web developer and I also teach and I'm so happy of what I've become. And it's because of start appliance and people being optimistic about who we are. So what I ask today is you to stop looking at us at like cases of, uh, the kind of cases when you see an African child, you just see poverty. 
or you see them begging, but look at it as an, as an opportunity because we also have skills that the same people seated right here have. And we also look at us as opportunities because we can work together. It's just that maybe you got the, the education before me, but right now there's a chance of an African child to stand here and say that I'm a web developer and I can work for someone here just like as I said. So look at us as an opportunity and we'd love to work together with you to make Africa a better place. So I want to say thank you so much for Startup and for DLD Conference for giving us this chance. And I want to go back home and be a change maker and say that I'm here because of the education I got from Startup. And I'll be forever grateful for this exposure. Thank and you. For this. Thank you. So, um, So um, to learn more about Maureen's uh, platform, she has a platform where you can buy goods from uh, Startup Lions in Turkana. You can find more information on startuplions.org. And um, thank you, Ludwig, because Ludwig basically said, I'm not coming to DLD unless if I can come with my students. So thank you so much for doing that. <laughs> and um, thank you. And thank you, Egosa, for being the bridge between Silicon Valley and Africa and continuing to show uh, the potential that is in Africa. Not only uh, do we have uh, avenues to invest in capital, but then also to invest in human capital, as we've seen today. So thank you, DLD. Thank you, Alexandra. And thank you, Steffi. Thank you. Thank you.